Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. We're really excited to kick off our events for the month of April. This month, we are looking at a theme of conservation. So, so we're going to talk to uh, explorers from and scientists from all over the world who have dedicated their life to protecting habitats as well as the wildlife within those habitats. So it's going to be a lot of fun this month. Now before we meet today's guest, I'm going to take a quick moment and share my screen using National Geographic's MapMaker Interactive and we're going to get a feel for where everybody is joining us from today. So just bear with me for one second while we get that screen uh, share started. All right. Huh. Well, for some funny reason, my screen does not appear to want to share today. Let me give it one more try. And if it doesn't work, then there's not a lot we can do about it. All right. Interesting. So I will have to tell you where our classrooms are joining us from today. So I'm in Allure, Ontario. I am in Canada. And as we start to back up a little bit more on the map, we have classrooms that are joining us in Waterloo, Ontario. We also have classrooms that are joining us in Ottawa and Vermilion Bay. And then in the US, we have classrooms who are joining us today in Minnesota, um, in Connecticut, in Maine, uh, in Halifax, um, and New Hampshire. So we have a lot of really cool classrooms that are joining us from different locations today. Uh, but you'll have to take my word for it because the screen share is not cooperating. So uh, I do want to give a shout out to any classrooms who are joining us on uh, YouTube today. You can still get in on the action. Use the chat sidebar on the right. Let us know where you're watching from and send in some questions and I'll work some of those in. And any classroom, whether you're on camera with us right now or you're hanging out on YouTube, take some pictures, share them on Twitter, tag at Nat Geo Education, hashtag Explore Classroom. We love to see our classrooms in action. All right, let's get to the main event. So, so excited to be joined by Gladys Kalama uh, Zikusoka today. Gladys is a wildlife veterinarian and conservationist working with critically endangered mountain gorillas in East Africa. Her work has been featured in the National Geographic documentary Wildlife Guardian and an article entitled Lair of the Silverback. After graduating from the University of London, she established the first veterinary department uh, in the Uganda Wildlife Authority. And this led her to establish conservation through public health. So CTPH, a grassroots NGO and nonprofit that promotes the coexistence of people, gorillas, and other wildlife by addressing human and wildlife health together and improving alternative livelihoods in communities sharing their habitat with gorillas. Well, Gladys, it is such a pleasure to have you joining us live today. We're so excited to learn a little bit more about your work. And then when the time comes, I know the classrooms are going to have a lot of questions for you. Thank you very much, Joe. <laughs> All right. Well, it's great to have you joining us. Can you tell the classrooms just very quickly where you're joining us from today? Hello, everybody. I'm joining you from Uganda. Uganda is in East Africa. Um, it's one of the three countries in East Africa. And it's the only, um, you, the only place where you can find mountain gorillas are in Uganda, Rwanda, and Democratic Republic of Congo. So we're Really pleased to be speaking with you today. All right. Well, we are thrilled to have you kicking off our conservation uh, explorations this month. And I think you might have a little bit to share with us, a little presentation to share with us. Yes, I have a presentation to share with you today. Um, let me go into share screen. Um, let me see. Can you see my screen? <laughs> uh, it didn't work. When you when you click the screen share, uh, was there the option to pick your whole desktop and then push the share button like this morning? Okay, let me try that. Um, yeah. So click the green share screen button and then there should be a, an option to hit share. Okay, screen share, entire screen. Okay, that looks better. Okay. So, uh, whoops, 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 whoops. <laughs> That's okay. Sometimes technology takes a second to get set up. Yes. 
Um, is that better? All right, success. We are full screen. <laughs> yes. So um, I'm really pleased to be able to speak to you today. I'm going to go through a set of slides um, focusing on the work that we're doing with the mountain gorillas. And I look forward to sharing all of this with you. There are actually no mountain gorillas in zoos in America. Um, I would love to have asked the, the, the kids from all the different schools if they've ever seen mountain gorillas, but I'm pretty sure they haven't because the minimum age to see mountain gorillas is 15 years old. Um, I'm really pleased to be a National Geographic explorer. I became an explorer at the beginning of 2018. And also last year, I was very pleased and honored to win the Sierra Club Earth Care Award. And I'm going to talk to you about gorilla conservation and my journey of setting up conservation through public health, which is also a US registered nonprofit. The gorilla on this screen is called Kanyonyi. He is one of my favorite gorillas, and I've known him since he was little, uh, since he was a baby. I operated on his older sister uh, when she had a problem, and I'll talk about that as well. And But Kanyonyi signifies how far conservation has gone where we are, because the national park became, gorillas started to become protected in the early 1990s, and Kanyonyi was born in 1996, shortly after that. So, but unfortunately, Kanyonyi died in 2017, end of 2017. But due to natural causes, he fell off a tree and then fought with another silverback when he was feeling really sick. And eventually he could not cope with all the, all the wounds. Even if he had an infection in his hip joint, he never got better in spite of treatment and he ended up dying. And his group disintegrated, but now some of them have got back together again. And so it's a long standing story of Kanyonyi but it signifies how far gorilla conservation has gone in Uganda. Um, gorillas live in families. And over there you see a silverback, which is just like Kanyonyi. Kanyonyi now became the head of his group after having been a baby, grown up seeing humans all his life. And now he started heading a group. So gorillas are headed by silverbacks, which is an adult male from the age of around 13 years old onwards, who then decides to have a family. So this is a silverback, a mother, and a baby. So gorillas live in families. And when you visit them, they, they're in families and they feel really safe being in families. They are endangered. I put critically in brackets because it's only until November last year, gorillas were critically endangered. They've been critically endangered for many decades, but because the mountain gorillas numbers are actually going up, even if there's only 1,000 gorillas remaining now, they've gone up from 800 to 1,000. There's two, the numbers are going up. So now the IUCN that determines the status of species decided that since this number is going up compared to other gorilla populations which are going down, let's make them endangered and not critically endangered. So it's, it's a great achievement in conservation. I've been working with gorillas for over 20 years and it was um, with mountain gorillas for over 20 years. So we're really pleased that now they're endangered and we hope that they don't have to go back again to critically endangered. Um, gorillas are very gentle giants. Their group sizes range on average about 15 gorillas in a group and they're led by a silverback. Over here is a mum with a baby. Gorillas are very motherly, they're very good mothers. So they look after their babies till they're four years old before they have another baby. And they carry them on their back for up to until the age of one or even two sometimes. And then at the beginning, they carry them on their front, then they carry them on their back. And so they're so similar to humans, just like we like to sometimes be on the backs of our moms or dads, so do baby gorillas. And they like eating shoots, stems and leaves. And the ones in Buindi also like eating fruit because they're at a lower altitude and they can get access to fruit. They love eating banana stems as well. They prefer the stems to the fruit. And this gorilla is one of my favorites as well. She's called uh, Karunji, which means beautiful. And she has a baby on her back. And I'd like to say that the baby on her back 
um, is now heading a group in Buindi. He's grown up enough that he's heading a group. He's called Kabukojo. And that's where Kanyonyi's offspring is now with his mom in Kabukojo's group. The Malte gorillas are found in two populations, which are very distinct. A um, hundred years ago, these populations were probably connected, but because of building up in the area, they're no longer connected. So there's Buindi up on the top where we have our work. There are about 400 gorillas here. And the Virungas, which is further down, in Rwanda, Uganda, and mainly DRC, and there's about 680 gorillas. But we hope that with the next census, the numbers are going to go up and there'll be, you know, there's 604 gorillas down here, 400 up here. We hope after the new census, which went on last year, the Bindi gorilla population will go up and we'll have over a thousand gorillas. They are threatened by poaching and habitat loss. Um, over here, you can see there's a very hard edge where they told people to stop cutting trees when it became a national park. But the gorillas sometimes go out because it used to be part of their range. And there's a high, very large families at the border of the park. They're threatened by poaching, not so much them, people eating them, but eating other animals in the forest. And when they eat other animals in the forest, they set snares for them and gorillas get caught in snares. They set snares for small antelope or small pigs that they like to eat. And these people do that because they're hungry. They want to find meat for their families and they're cutting trees because they want to get firewood to cook food for their families. So it's very basic needs why their habitats are threatened all over the world where they're found. Um, however, there's another threat to gorillas called disease. Uh, one of the very first cases I had to handle as the first veterinarian for the Uganda Wildlife Authority was a scabies skin disease outbreak in the mountain gorillas, which was eventually traced to people living around the park. The baby gorilla you can see here ended up dying it lost almost all its hair and was even crying just before um, the mom dropped it after it died. And the rest of the group was scratching a lot. Even when we took samples from them, they were scratching during the anesthetic. But they got better because we got them, gave them the right treatment, ivermectin. And eventually we found out that it came from people living around the park who had very little health care. These little boys were at the edge of the park herding goats. Um, they're about seven years old downwards. Actually, maybe the oldest is nine, same age as some of you on the call today. Um, but they were not going to school. They were just herding goats. So, and they're very poor. They come from very poor families and they're likely to interface with gorillas quite a lot of the time. And the gorillas actually likely got the scabies when they went outside the park to eat banana stems and they found dirty clothing on scarecrows. And some of the dirty clothing is the clothing that these children wear, as you can see in the photo, because they're very poor. Gorillas also come into contact with people when they cross streams like this one, and they share water sources with the people. This is actually a micro hydro dam built in the forest to tap water to create electricity. So the forest, as you may be learning, is important for the wildlife in it, but it's also a very good source of water. And this water can be used to tap electricity, to make electricity, which can give people power and give them a better quality of life. But they love crossing over here and playing, and people cross here and sometimes cut across there as well. So what we do in conservation through public health is we keep gorillas healthy and their habitat secure. This view is the view that we have outside our office in Buindi, a really nice view of the office, but it gives it goes, takes you all the way to the edge of the forest from one area to another. And this forest is 330 square kilometers. And inside here, all through here are gorillas, different gorilla groups, plus other animals in the forest like chimpanzees and elephants and birds and other monkeys. So we have three main programs, wildlife conservation, community health and alternative livelihoods. And they're all linked to each other. We work with the Uganda Wildlife Authority to protect the gorillas and their habitat. We monitor the health of the gorillas. We conduct research. We compare diseases in gorillas, people, and livestock, and we carry out veterinary interventions. So how do we keep the gorillas healthy? This is a baby gorilla um, on the back of his mom, um, really adorable. And how can we keep them healthy? Because it's baby gorillas like this one that need to survive in order for the gorilla populations to grow, for the species to, to not be so critically endangered. 
Um, we, we sometimes carry out treatments. We're treating a young gorilla of six years old called Kahara that had a prolapse. The rectum came out of the body and we had to amputate it and stitch back the rest. And eventually um, Kahara got up and she recovered and she ended up, uh, she's actually the older sister of Kanyonyi, the big gorilla I showed you at the beginning. Um, that time he was a baby and they called her Kahara, which means uh, good, good big sister because she liked looking after, babysitting her younger brother. But when she came of age, she left the group and went to a wild group that we don't visit often. We actually, we never see the wild groups. So she went to a wild group and we lost track of her, but um, we hope that she's having babies wherever she is. So sometimes we have to deal with such cases and we believe that she got the prolapse by having contact with human, you know, human fecal material and getting sick and which caused her to strain and then the rectum came out. And this is the place where gorillas come into contact with human clothing or human fecal material. This particular gorilla has now graduated to eating bananas from beating banana stems. And this photograph was sent to me by a tour operator. And we have a group of people who chase gorillas back to the park when they come out onto community, onto community land. They chase them back and they're members of the local community and their community volunteers who everybody really values and appreciates because they're doing a great job. And so we work with them to monitor the gorilla's health as well. And then uh, the park staff collect fecal samples. This is gorilla dung in a night nest. So they collect fecal samples from the gorillas like there. And we collect them every month and also when they're abnormal. And from there, we're able to analyze the samples. This is a student from a vet school in the US. University of California, Davis, who was looking at um, diseases in livestock, gorillas, and people, working one of our volunteers. And these are students, one of them is from US, and one of them is from UK, and they were looking at, all of this is gorilla dung. These are fecal samples from gorillas, which we're analyzing, together with another founder member, Stephen Rubanga, who's a vet technician. We're looking to see what diseases they could be picking up from people, wildlife, and livestock. And then we carry out a a lot of education. We, you know, promote the link. We talk about the links between people and gorillas and how people and gorillas can make each other sick. And we translate it into the local language. I designed these brochures. And then uh, we get kids to go out and, you know, act the plays. But over here, one of our volunteers is actually talking about the same issues using a flip chat, talking about, you know, important, why it's important to be healthy and hygienic you know, plan for your family, look out for people who are sick. And she talks about how you should eat well and, you know, report homes visited by gorillas and how you shouldn't threaten the gorillas in their habitat and how you should, you know, start using energy saving cook stoves so you don't need so much firewood from the forest. Some of these volunteers also give injections um, when they go out there in order to improve the quality of life of the community. And we also give them livestock to keep them going because they are purely volunteers and they're doing really well with that. So some of the impact we've had is that gorillas are now protected in community land. Um, when Ruhendeza, the father of Kanyonyi, got really old, um, in 2012, he decided he can't keep up with the rest of the group and decided to settle in community land. So we talked to our volunteers, the ones who you saw here, giving injections and carrying out community education. We talked to them and told them to talk to their community because each of them have certain homes they visit every every month or every quarter. And each of them, you know, give village talks and go to churches and talk about why gorillas are important and why people should remain healthy. They, we told them to tell people that they should tolerate having Ruhendeza, Kanyonyi's father, in their land. And uh, because he's done so much for them and he doesn't want to be in the forest anymore. He feels safer outside. And they did, and the community were really protecting Ruhendeza um, because they realized that Ruhendeza was so accommodating that tourism began and it's helping to get them out of poverty because the money from tourism is shared with the local community. And so when Kanyonyi, when Ruhendeza died, they came and visited his grave and played their last respects. So now we're so happy that gorillas are better protected in community land. Um, more homes are wash washing, um, more homes are have hand washing facilities to wash their hands outside the toilet. There's been less disease outbreaks in gorillas. We've not had a scabies outbreak since we started the NGO CTPH and 
now we're finding that gorillas are not getting giardia anymore, which causes very bad diarrhea. Um, and we've had an increase in family planning significantly over threefold. And it's now above the national average, which has also gone up in rural areas. So we want to expand this approach to other gorilla habitats and biodiversity hotspots, which is places where you have very high human population growth and very critical species like chimpanzees or elephants or other species like that, working with other non-profits or government agencies or you know private sector to be able to apply this technique of improving the health of the people to get them to care about the wildlife that they share a habitat with. So I'd like to thank you so much for listening to this presentation and I look forward to your questions. All right, Gladys, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Uh, you really are doing some amazing work. Um, you know, a lot of students probably don't realize that gorillas are so similar to us that we can transmit diseases to them. So taking care of the local human populations will mm -hmm. also help take care of the gorilla populations as well. So a great approach uh, to conservation to protect not only the health, but the land as well. Um, so Gladys, if you minimize the presentation and click the green button in the hangout window again, that'll bring you back to us. Okay. Um, minimize it. Perfect. Um, and then hit the green button and you'll be back. Okay. All yes, right. I'm back. <laughs> All right. Well, let's start meeting some of our classrooms because I'm sure they've got questions about the work you're doing, the gorillas, and maybe even some questions about Uganda as well. So let's start visiting our classrooms. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Mrs. Holden's group. They're hanging out with us in Spruce Grove, Alberta. So here in Canada, let's get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, Alberta? All right, who's got a question? <laughs> How did you start working with gorillas? Okay. How did I start working with gorillas? Um, I started working, that's a great question. Um, when I was in high school in Uganda, in, Uganda um, in my last year of high school, I got the opportunity to set up a wildlife club, which is a club that's um, in all the school, many schools in Uganda, where you educate children about wildlife. And I set it up and I was the chairperson of the wildlife club. And they always told me that there are mountain gorillas in Uganda, but they've not yet been habituated for tourism. Or, or, and so I was very excited. I was like, I wish one day I could get to study the mountain gorillas. Then I got a chance to do vet school in London, Royal Vet College, University of London. And I started doing, doing vet school there. And I got a chance to study an animal of my choice. And I convinced them that I wanted to study the mountain gorillas. So I was able to eventually come and study the mountain gorillas when tourism had just begun. This was in 1994 and uh, tourism had begun in 1993. And it was fantastic because when I was able to start to study the mountain gorillas and do research on them. So that's how I first started working with them through my, you know, through setting up a wildlife club in school. We have them both in primary and, you know, like uh, middle school, high school and uh, the lowest grade schools. And that got me interested in wildlife and eventually working with the mountain gorillas. All right, very cool. I think that's a really good message for the classrooms. If you're passionate about something, especially something like animals or the ocean, you can start at a young age with a club or something like that and then continue on and study it in the future. So that's an awesome story. I wanna give a shout out to, let's see, where did there go? Ah, there we go. A shout out to Mrs. Boyle's group. Some grade sixes hanging out with us in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So they're in the hangout with us, but their camera isn't cooperating. So they're gonna send me some questions in the chat. So grade sixes, I'll keep an eye out for your questions. And I'll use this as a quick time to remind any classrooms who are tuning in uh, via YouTube to send in some questions as well. Let us know where you're watching from. But we're gonna go to Woodbury this time. Um, we're gonna join Mrs. Gary's class. I'm gonna turn their microphone on. Let's see if we can get it on. How are we doing, boys and girls? Good! Oh, nice loud clap. I bet they've got a good question. How do you count the gorillas? 
Wow, that's a fantastic question. Um, how do we count gorillas? It's not that easy. Because as you saw from my presentation, they live in a very thick forest. So it's really difficult to find them. Um, but however, how do we count them? Gorillas build a bed every night. We call it a night nest. They'll build a nest every night and they sleep in it. And all of them build a nest from the age of four years upwards, because now they're considered old enough to build the nest. And when they build a nest in the morning, just after they, before they get out of their nest, they normally defecate on their nest. So you're able to tell from the size of the nest and the size of the dung, whether it's a baby, whether it's a juvenile of six years old or a mother or a big adult silverback male. And so what you do when you're counting them in a gorilla census is you have teams of people moving through the forest at the same time. So we don't double count the gorillas and you create transects in the forest. So you cut the forest up into different sections and each group has about six people and you move through the forest together and you have to find three consecutive night nests. Like let's say you have to find three night nests of let's say 10 nests and you keep following the trail. And if you find 10 nests three times, then you know that this is one gorilla group. And you count the number of, the amount of dung in the nest. If it's a mom and a baby, you see two sets of dung. And then you know, let's say there are three mothers, then you have, let's say 13 gorillas in that group that build 10 nests. And then from there, you keep sweeping through the forest. The next day you go to a different part of the forest. And so eventually you're able to count all the gorillas in the forest and everybody adds up their numbers and then you've counted them. But however, we've also started adding genetic studies. So with the, every time you collect dung from the nest, you can do genetic studies, you can do disease studies, or with the genetic studies, you may find that one gorilla has built more than one nest. Um, so that helps to correct for some errors. But at the end of it, then you're able to count all the gorillas and it takes about two months to count all of them. And lately we've decided to start counting them twice because you find that when you, when you count them for two months, like last year it was from March to May, then after six months they were counted again from October to December, just in case you missed out some in the first sweep. So yeah, it's quite a complicated activity, but it's a lot of fun. And a lot of hard work walking through the forest, camping in the forest, you get really tired and exhausted, but you really learn a lot. Because actually when we count gorillas, we don't only count gorillas, but we also count chimps or monkeys or elephants, small antelope, any other sign in the forest we count. So it's an opportunity to count everything in the forest. All right. Great question. And uh, yeah, it sounds like you can learn a lot from the nests that they leave behind and, and what they leave behind in the nests. Very cool. Uh, let's see, let us go to Mrs. Elliott's class. They are in Vermilion Bay in Ontario, so here in Canada, it's a grade five, six class. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are you doing, five, six, six? Good! Hi! <laughs> What's the normal lifespan for a mountain gorilla? Great, the normal lifespan for a mountain gorilla um, ranges from around 40 years old, 40 to 50 years old. So it's not very different from humans when there was no modern medicine. So yes, gorillas can live for quite a long time. I mean, I've ever done a, um, a necropsy on a gorilla that was really old, Mugurusi, who was called old man because he was old. When they started habituating the gorillas, he was already old. So when he died, um, he, was, he must have been about 50. And he had a lot of old age related changes like heart failure and kidney failure. So yes, they live almost as long as humans do. Which is pretty amazing. All right, good question. Uh, Mrs. Reader Norris's class. They're hanging out with us in Waterloo, Ontario, some grade fours. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing grade fours? Good. <laughs> Can you hear us? Yes, we can. <laughs> Do people listen to you when you talk about gorillas? Um, could you repeat that question again, please? Do people listen to you when you talk about gorillas? Yes, people really listen to me when, when I talk about gorillas because it's fascinating for people. 
I mean, people are really fascinated by gorillas because they're so similar to us. I mean, we share over 98% genetic material. And so a lot of the things that they do, we can do. So everybody is really fascinated by gorillas. You know, you saw how the mother was carrying her baby on the back. You know, I'm sure you've also ridden on your mom's back um, or your dad's back. Um, yeah, gorillas are so similar to us. They, are, they look after their babies for a long time. You know, they really care about their young. They're very good mothers, very good dads. Um, yeah, we're so similar. We do a lot of things which are similar. And when you visit them in the wild and you look at them, they really connect. You really feel like you're, you're connecting. And they have the intelligence of a five-year-old child. Um, so, yeah, people always listen because they're fascinated by gorillas. And just to add to that question, um, when you share in the local communities, are they just as excited as if you share with maybe classrooms in the United States? Um, yeah, well, that's a good question. Of course, the classrooms in the United States are much more interested and excited to hear about gorillas. But in the local community, when you talk about how similar they are to us, like, for example, when I try to explain to them how they got scabies, because their, their babies are just as curious as human babies. So when they see something, they want to touch it or they want to put it in their mouths. And I said, that's how they can pick up diseases from us, just like your human babies can. They were really fascinated and they're like, wow, okay, gorillas are so similar to us. The babies are like our babies. The mothers are like us. They, they like to look after their babies. They care so much about their young. Then they start to get interested and fascinated. But of course, they're not happy when gorillas destroy their banana plants and everything. So, so it takes a while to get them to start appreciating that the gorillas are also important in spite of sometimes them doing things that they don't like um, in their garden. But yeah, so eventually they start to like them. And one thing they love about the gorillas now is because a lot of tourists come to visit and pay money. And that money goes to, to build their community, schools, you know, hospitals. Many of their children are employed by the park. They, and they like the fact that the money from guerrilla tourism is going to support education, healthcare, and give jobs to their communities, to their children. And they now they really like the guerrillas for that as well. <laughs> yeah, and I think that that's a really important message is by protecting the forest, by protecting the animals, you can actually earn a lot more money for the community by protecting instead of taking from the forest. So that's a really important lesson. Yeah. Uh, this is Thurston's class, hanging out in Ottawa, Ontario. Some grade fives. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Ottawa? Um, Hello. Uh, what other diseases can be transmitted from human to gorillas? Okay, so that the microphone was a little tricky on that one, but I think your question was, what other diseases can be transferred from humans to gorillas? Is that right? Yes. Is that the question? Okay. Yep. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, other than scabies, there's lots of diseases that can be transmitted from humans to gorillas, and even the opposite direction. Um, gorillas can also give us diseases, but it's much easier for us to go to the doctor than them. But they can get um, respiratory diseases like cough, flu, you know, when you're coughing and sneezing all the time. Um, gorillas in Rwanda, uh, Volcano National Park, got, you know, a couple of gorillas died of a respiratory disease, uh, which was traced to South Africa, Australian South Africa, so likely a tourist from South Africa. So they can get flu from us. They can get tuberculosis, all the respiratory diseases they can get. Um, they can also get uh, diarrhea, you know, like cholera, typhoid, intestinal diseases from us, you know, so they can get skin diseases, intestinal diseases, flu or cough. Um, they can pick up all those kind of diseases from us. So almost everything we can we get, they can get. Like Jardia, which I mentioned, is a disease which is spread by through fecal matter. You know, like if you drink water and somebody is defecated in the water or a cow has defecated in the water and somebody drinks it or a gorilla drinks it, they can get Jardia and they can get very, very sick. Or Salmonella or any of those. All right. Well, definitely one of the negatives of being so closely related is that we can share uh, those similar uh, diseases and infections. Uh, we're going to go to Cape Elizabeth, Maine this time. We've got some grade fours hanging out with us with Mrs. McInnes and uh, Mrs. Whipple. Let's get that microphone turned on. Oh, there they are. 
How, yeah. uh, hi. How can we help to um, save the mountain gorillas in Uganda? Oh, that's a great question. Um, how can you help to save the mountain gorillas in Uganda? You can share the word. You can share, tell people about the gorillas and all the things that, that we're doing with them. Um, actually, I do have, let me see, there's a presentation I made to some students one time and I talked about the best thing that they can do. You can also um, make a poster or a leaflet about our work. That's one way of sharing. You can also uh, set up a special event, a fundraising event um, about the gorillas. Um, yeah, you can do all of those. And when you're old enough, you can come and visit us in Uganda and actually see the gorillas for yourself. But you could also team up with the local zoo where gorillas are found and see how they can uh, partner with us to support our work here in Uganda. Because I know that some zoos in America have gorillas in the exhibits. And if there's a way that we can link those gorillas in the exhibits, which are like ambassadors for the ones in the wild, to the work that we're doing and do a joint fundraiser, that would be really great. We also have um, a social enterprise called Gorilla Conservation Coffee, where we work with coffee farmers and stop them destroying the gorillas' habitat and poaching by buying their coffee at a good price and selling it at a good price. So some of those zoos have gift shops that they can buy the coffee, or you can order it online, where we're selling it in America through Pangos. It's a conservation company that also promotes pangolins, which are also very endangered. So yes, all those ways you can you can spread the word and you know create some nice posters about gorillas and you know all those kind of things. <laughs> all right, great things to think about. Personally, I think coming to visit sounds pretty darn cool. Um, <laughs> but you're right. Every student who's hanging out with us, with us as well. <laughs> yeah, any student who's hanging out with us today can um, tell just one other person even about something they learned about gorillas and the conservation work and why they're in trouble. And then that person tells somebody else that can make a big difference. You can even make posters and put them around your school. So lots of great ways uh, that you can help out. Let's jump over to Mrs. Custer's class. We have some 11th graders hanging out with us. They're at Hanover High School. Let's get their microphone turned on. How are you doing, Eleven? Hey. Um, hi. Have you always, or were you always interested in veterinary medicine, or did you ever, did you start getting interested in it when you had your environmental club in your school? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, I grew up at home with lots of pets. Um, I was the last born in the family, and my elder sister, who I followed, is five and a half years old years older than me. Actually, she called me just before I was going to start speaking to you. And so I never really had playmates because she was a lot older than me, so she wasn't really my playmate. But we had loads, we had cats and dogs at home and I really hated to see them suffering. Um, if they got sick, for example, I wouldn't go to school until my mom took them to the vet. So then by the age of 12, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian who works with domestic animals. But after setting up the wildlife club in school, then I thought I want to be a vet who works with wildlife. And so that's how we, I ended up eventually working mainly with wildlife as a wildlife veterinarian. All right, so we still have a couple minutes. So we might be able to visit one or two more classrooms. So give me a wave if we need to come back to your classroom if you guys have a follow-up question. See if we can squeeze something in. So let's start off. I see lots of waving in Mrs. Holden's class. Let's get their microphone back on. Is there teenager gorillas? Oh, that's a cool question. Yes, there are teenager gorillas. Um, you have like sub-adult sub males um, and females. So the age between before they, they become moms and dads and they've stopped being juveniles. And they're like teenager gorillas are maybe around the age of eight. Between the age of eight and 10, we consider them to be teenage gorillas. And they're quite playful and they like, you know, like, because especially if they've grown up seeing people all their lives, um, because their group has been habituated for tourism or research, they can be quite naughty, try and frighten tourists or visitors who come to see them. But yes, we do have teenage gorillas. All right, very cool. They sound 
similar in a lot of ways to teenage uh, people as well. Let's see. Uh, yes. Mrs. Norris or Reader Norris's class. Do you guys have another question? Yes, we do. Um, one second. Go. Can I say one more? Because I have. Uh, what do you do? What do the gorillas do if you try to help them? And do you help them when they're hurt? Yes, the gorillas, when we try to help them, um, that's a good question. When we try and help the gorillas, like we find out if they're sick, if they have an abnormal appearance, if they look abnormal, if they have abnormal behavior. Like normally if a gorilla is very active and you go into the group and they're not active, you think they may be sick. Um, or if they, you know, like they have scabies, they look different from what they normally look like, you start to worry that they may be sick. And what do we, how do we treat them? We sometimes have to immobilize them. So you get a, a dart gun, you load the anesthetic drug and you dart them from a distance. And once they're down, you have to chase, safely chase away the father because he's so protective and the rest of the group. And the humans form a tent around the gorilla that you're going to treat. And then you treat the gorilla. And once you've treated that gorilla, given them the treatment, then you have to return them safely back to the group. And normally the dad is angry, he charges, but you're not supposed to run. Because if you do, everyone else will get hurt. And then you gently introduce the gorilla back to the group and move back. So it's a very, very emotionally intense experience and it really disturbs the group's behavior. So we try our best to only do it when it's human related or life threatening. Because some gorillas, when they fight, um, they can get better by themselves. And you really shouldn't intervene when they're fighting because that's normal behavior. And it may be time for another adult male to take over the group. And you have to allow new genes in the population. There's a lot of natural selection going on in the wild. So you really have to carefully consider before you go ahead and do something like that. But we also help the gorillas on a daily basis um, by looking out to see if they're sick. And every month we collect samples from their night nests. And if you find blood in the nest or the dung sample looks abnormal, then you find out what is there. Then you can go out and just dart the animal with a drug. It's an antibiotic or an antiparasitic without having to put them, you know, make them sleep. And if you do it like that, then this less disruptive to the group. <laughs> All right. Well, Gladys, thank you so much for uh, hanging out with us today. That was great. Uh, you're doing some awesome work. It's great to hear the success, right? Sometimes we hear a lot of the negative stories, but it's great to hear that the population is slowly climbing and it's working with communities, making sure the animals are healthy, all really important things. So I really hope that other organizations listen uh, to your advice and see the success of your program and that we keep seeing those mountain gorilla numbers climbing. Thank you so much, Jill. And thank you all the classes that have joined us today um thank you all for your support and keep spreading the word and actually my sons who are like 10 and 14 say hello but they're in uh school right now so they're not able to join in today but oh, they know okay. so much about gorillas <laughs> actually wow. our 14 year old can't wait to visit them when he's 15 because he has to be 15 and he's never seen them he's been going to buindi park where they're found since he was a few months old but he's never seen them yet so he's really excited about that wow, that'll, <laughs> that'll be pretty special that'll be amazing um, <laughs> All right, well, things are about to get loud. I'm gonna turn on all the microphones, boys and girls, if you wanna get nice and loud and say goodbye and thank you, and then we'll sign off for today. So here we go, microphones are coming on. Thank you. Excellent job, you guys love that. All right, thanks so much. We look forward to more Explorer Classrooms next week. And uh, thanks so much, everybody. Have a good night. Have a good afternoon. Thank you so much.